Ono dobre, dobre by bolo možno, že niekedy na budúce, že keby tá obrazovka bola tam vpredu, ne? Preto, preto... Ja rozumiem, ok. Uh-huh, že ju dávate, hej. Uh-huh. Lebo vlastne, tak by som sa pozeral do kamery a zároveň by som videl, čo sa deje v, ako na zoom, hej. Ok. Hey. Áno. Ono dobre, dobre. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our second workshop, which we organize in the framework of the initiative of Slovak-Norwegian cultural matching. This initiative is, is implemented by the Creative Industry Košice and uh, the Norwegian partner Urban Space Lab, represented by Lori Vestal. It is supported by I- Iceland, Liechtenstein and uh, 
uh, Norway through the EEA grants and Norway grants. The original title of our today's workshop is Humanistic Approach to Sustainable Architecture. During the discussion with our partners and speakers, we have decided to change the title to Humanitarian Approach to Sustainable Architecture. Where the word humanitarian, we understand simply as actively seeking to promote human welfare. We believe this change will make our topic more relevant and it will better reflect the current situation in Europe. I have the honor to welcome our four speakers who will share with us their experiences in the humanitarian activities. But before doing so, let me give you a few technical details about our workshop. First, this workshop is streamed in Slovak and English language. On the Facebook page of Creative Industry Košice, you will find the Slovak interpretation of the workshop. If you wish to, to follow the event in English language, in the original language, please go to the YouTube channel, which is listed also on the Facebook page. Second, if you wish to ask questions, we have uh, provided a slider code, and you, so you can use the slider application for asking questions. After every presentation, we will take a round of questions, so you can ask your question in Slovak or English language. Thirdly, we would like to hear from you and get the feedback about how you liked uh, today's workshop. So please use the slide again to, to give us the feedback by, by uh, marking the stars in the poll on the slide. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is Veronika Poklembová, the director of ETP Slovakia, Center for Sustainable Development. Since 2020, Veronika is the director of a non-profit organization, ETP Slovakia, where they have working with socially disadvantaged groups studies at the Technical University in Bratislava, she completed a one-year voluntary internship in Britain, where she worked in a community centre with refugees and at schools in poor areas of Birmingham. She also worked in a project called Teaching Team Ladies and gentlemen, due to technical problems, we have to postpone the start of our workshop today. So please hold on, keep, keep, on the keep being on the Facebook and on the YouTube channel. We'll be soon, soon starting our workshop.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would like to apologize for technical problems we encountered. We can now uh, go on with our, with our workshop. So let me introduce our first speaker, who is Veronika Poklembova, director of ETP Slovakia, Center for Sustainable Development. Since 2020, Veronika is a director of a non-profit organization, ATP Slovakia, where they have been working with socially disadvantaged groups, mostly in the eastern part of Slovakia, for more than 20 years. Since 2017, they also operate on Košice's housing estate, Lunik 9. After her doctoral studies at the Technology University at Bratis in Bratislava, she completed a one-year voluntary internship in Britain, where she worked in a community centre with refugees and at school in the poor areas of Birmingham. She also worked in a project team of the chief architect of the city of Bratislava. And for the two years she taught in a school in Bardio through the program Teach for Slovakia. Ladies and gentlemen, Veronika. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I will now share my screen and start my presentation. So hopefully everything will work fine. Um, yes. You should see my screen now. So yes. hopefully, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Veronika. Um, as Martin said, I'm the director of uh, ETP Slovakia. And um, our, our mission is to um, create um, and mainstream opportunities for people living in generational poverty or marginalized communities through, through our programs. Uh, we have been implemented mostly um, in the area of East Slovakia for for the last couple of, uh, of, of years. And um, um, to give you a brief overview of the presentation, um, uh, I will start uh, with the explanation of the concept of uh, uh, bridges from poverty or poverty to, uh, to self-sufficiency. And then uh, shortly say a few words about other programs uh, we, uh, we are implementing. Um, about a saving and microloan program, uh, which is mostly um, focusing on improving housing conditions for people uh, from marginalized communities, and then three other projects that that are all very uh, connected to Košice and uh, to Luning 9 district, which is a, a Roma ghetto here in, in the city. And um, so I will go to the, to the next slide. Okay, now I hope it will work yes this is um uh, okay yeah more or less you can see it well that's, that's the concept behind our work what we are trying to uh, or approach we are aiming for in our work when uh, supporting people uh living in poverty we believe that it's uh, it's important to to be able to help them to break out from the circle of poverty, we need to take a complex approach. And uh, this picture is a, like a, like a model of of, of bridge, uh, which is supposed to take people uh, uh, farther towards a more self sufficient life. And as 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 the as the model as the picture um, shows, uh, the 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 bridge stands on several pillars that represents uh, different areas of life. We have to be aware of and and be very conscious about supporting people in each of the areas to be able uh, able to help them really effectively in um, in uh, their in, in their way towards a uh, more self sufficient life. Um, and today, uh, I will focus more on this uh, first pillar. Let's say uh, uh, the stability of the family, which includes uh, housing conditions of the family. Um, so, um, uh, this, these are several pictures that are representing uh, results or small uh, projects, interventions, improvements we have supported through our saving and microloan program. We have been implementing since uh, 2007 
and uh, we have distributed over uh, 550 microloans, uh, from which almost 80% uh, have already been paid back. And it's uh, a non-profit. Uh, it's a non-profit revolving fund, uh, which was initially funded by Habitat uh, for Humanity and and uh, um, company Holland and other donors. And from the money we get back. Uh, we we uh, are funding and contributing again again to towards our programs uh, for housing and and uh, towards loans to other clients. And um, the idea is that the individual or the family is um, saving for a certain amount of of time. And after after that, when they reach their goals, they are eligible to get a micro loan or a bonus or both. And um, uh, some of the uh, some of the um, ways how they how they usually usually used it were for example to improve their current housing like to replace windows or extend their housing or uh, the, the the picture on the very um, on the left um, uh, upper side uh, is um, uh, where the apartment housing all the tenants or all the people living there they agreed they would save up some money and then share the costs and replace their, uh, their old roof uh, on, on the on the house apartment house and uh, and the, on the very uh, bottom uh, on the right side you can see a project of self-help construction of family houses uh, so for example uh, the, the the families there uh, it was in Rankotse um, um, it started like um, uh, I think it's now 10 years ago. And uh, the families, they had to save at least 50 euro per month for one year to save up some money. Then they got uh, some extra bonus and a loan from which they paid the construction materials and they built the houses themselves with the help of a construction teacher. Um, and this uh, uh, is a... Uh, now I'm going to tell you more about a different project here in Košice. Um, it's also connected to self-help construction of, of, uh, of houses. Um, this picture uh, is uh, representing Lunik 9. It's a photo taken in autumn last year during Pope's visit in Košice in Lunik because you can also see some temporary constructions there, like uh, stages and backstage, some, uh, some tents in the street. So that's uh, uh, not like this uh, all the time, but it's very uh, interesting to see it um, like a snapshot of this moment. Um, and on the on the bottom of the picture, um, there is Rebendova Street, where we are currently uh, implementing this project of self-help construction of, of houses and also a, a showcase house or a community house, which will be like the um, uh, premises for the for the ongoing projects and also for other activities we are doing at LUNIC. Um, and picture is uh, like a master plan for the future possible um, um, scenario or development of, of, of LUNIC 9. It's, uh, uh, I think it was approved uh, three years ago and it was like a result of a a uh, competition of architects and urban planners uh, where they uh, could uh, come up with ideas for the future development of this uh, 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 area. And uh, what is interesting is that only uh, uh, one, maybe two thirds of this area is currently owned by the city of Kosice or municipality. It's it's all um, surrounded by this um, continuous red um, dotted line and the other, the rest is uh, uh, owned by different private owners. And so the future um, possible extension and uh, possible development is, uh, of this uh, area is depending on the, uh, uh, if, if the land uh, can be um, available for, for future construction. So this have to be uh, dealt with. And these are the these are some pictures from the first phase of this uh, self-help construction project. But it's actually the first building, which is uh, which is the let's uh, so so-called showcase house or the community house. Uh, 
where we will be soon, hopefully soon, starting uh, some of the activities we are we are doing at Lunignan, and then six or seven um, family houses will will follow on this on the same street on Hrebendova. and the first family should be uh, starting as soon as they get the uh, building permit, which should be in spring this year. And uh, the people you can see on this uh, construction site are um, um, uh, people of, from uh, or staff of the uh, social enterprise, which is run by the by Košice self-governing region, and they are working with, with us together on this project to to build this first uh, first house or community house in Lunik, and. This is how the um, first family house uh, or the family houses should look like with two rooms and uh, toilets, bathroom and, and, and an entrance hall and then possible uh, um, another room which is currently um, um, covered by roof. It's like a terrace, but uh, in, in the future, if they have enough money, they can extend and, and build another room there. Um, and Two more projects I still have. Uh, one of them is, is connected uh, to this Rebendova Street again. Um, when when we have when we've been preparing this uh, um, construction project, we were also uh, talking a lot about this environment with uh, with uh, young people and the kids uh, from Lunik, and um, they are very active and they came up with idea that we should improve uh, the public space there as well. So. <clears throat> this, they are holding a picture of, of a very um, a simple visual representation, how they would uh, want it to look like. And um, uh, there were several rounds of discussions. They also visited the mayor of Luning 9 and also we have discussed it with the city of Košice and got some funding also from the city and from a small grant from Norway, Norwegian uh, grants as well. Um, and they have started, uh, okay, so this is, uh, how it looked like a year ago, and then this is what, what they have been doing uh, uh, recently. So this is from summer and autumn last year. Uh, uh, so the kids and their parents and young people from Luning, they were taking part in not only designing uh, or coming up with ideas how it could look in the future, but they are also taking uh, really uh, taking part in, in the implementation, and we are also planning to continue with these interventions. And what is interesting about this project is that it's not only about the physical space, uh, the public space, but this Hrebendova uh, street and this space particularly uh, used to be like, a, like an uh, unfamous icon of how Lunik looks. When, when the journalists came, they would usually take picture of this spot uh, full of face and uh, illegal dam. And the kids, they said that uh, they really want to, they're very aware of this and they really want to change the um, image of their uh, district and they want to do it like this. So they want to transform it uh, into a proper playscape, a place for children and something which, which can be very uh, nice and uh, like a contrast to the previous uh, experience. And uh, the last thing I, I will share with you is Something uh, a bit different, but still very connected to this um, topic of poverty, understanding poverty and housing. Uh, it's a uh, mobile escape room. We have uh, uh, we have uh, created uh, with um, Košice uh, artists uh, two years ago. It's a mobile escape room, so we can move it anywhere. Uh, and it's all based about on the idea of understanding and experiencing some of the challenges of poverty. So people, when, when they are living in, a, in a, a very low quality housing and they want to uh, somehow improve their living conditions and get better jobs, better education. And so what, what challenges they have to face and all the, all the challenges, all the tasks in the game are based around this concept of uh, bridges from poverty and also on the experiences we have from our uh, everyday work in the, in the marginalized communities. And it's aimed on general public and it's um, an experiential way of maybe open, opening up the discussion of uh, understanding 
what the challenges of for people living in poverty are and how how to bridge the how to bridge the differences and uh, the gaps. Yes, so that would be my final slide and thank you for now. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Veronika. <coughs> the, uh, Veronika Poklembova is the director of the ETP Slovakia, working at the Roma, Roma settlement in Eastern Slovakia. Now I would like to take the opportunity, uh, <coughs> if you have any questions, it's time uh, you, can, uh, you can ask them if you would like to clarify something that Veronika uh, said. I think it's, uh, it's great to, to, to hear from, from very passionate people about helping others. And uh, I, we could see that uh, really the small steps are very important, empowering these, uh, these poor, marginalized people uh, for breaking the, the, the cycle of poverty, which is really something very, very, very dramatic in, uh, in uh, some communities in uh, Slovakia. So, if we don't have any questions for now, you can, you can always ask later on. I would like to uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Lindsay Senner. Lindsay will join us from, from Norway. And she's the founder of Eko Moyo Education Norway. Eko Moyo project is a Norwegian foundation based in Oslo and Telemark, funded on digital platforms. They run a Kenyan primary school with the mission to improve the quality of life for <coughs> underprivileged children in Kenya. The school is built together with architect students and artists from all over the world and has become a melting pot for interdisciplinary projects from education and art to engineering and agriculture. The project has a long-term collaboration with Architects Without Borders and Engineers Without Borders and works strategically to meet many of the UN sustainability goals. Power, water and construction on the Kenyan side all have been designed with sustainability and an anchor and continue to guide the project to prepare for climate change that is already noticeable in the region. Lindsay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. So can you see my presentation full screen? Yes, very good. Yeah? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Martin. Thank you so much for inviting us. I'm saying us because Jan will talk more about the architecture at Ecomoyo later. Um, so my name is Lindsay Sanner. I'm the founder of Ecomoyo, which is um, basically a school in Kenya, a primary school, and also a Norwegian foundation. Um, so for today, I wanted to talk about the Ecomoyo story. How did this all start? Um, something called the Ecomoyo Auction, which is an auction online on eBay, um, supporting the project, coming up starting tomorrow, very exciting. And also about our collaborations with Engineers Without Borders and Architects Without Borders. Um, this project started um, with me. Um, I really wanted to be a resource for someone. I was working with film and TV in Norway. It didn't feel very meaningful. I was making reality trash TV and I was like, oh, I need to do something interesting. I need to do something meaningful. So I tried to find myself in all the corners of the world and I ended up in Kenya where I found my African self. So I originally started working at an orphanage, but long story short, the corruption was insane and I immediately realized that if I want to do something sensible, I need to control the finances and be in charge of my own project. So. Um, I started the school, Ecomoyo, and um, I mean, eco is short for ecology and moyo means heart for Swahili. So my big, big dream was to start um, 
a green school, a really awesome quality five-star school for the kids who have nothing. Because at this time, I was also getting to know a group of kids that I really wanted to support. They didn't have money for school, and the private schools in Kenya are so expensive, and the government schools are so shit. So I was like, screw it, I'll just start my own freaking school and a farm, which I did. Um, so this is a drone image of the school, which is in the bush. And this is also a picture of our kids. Um, this year, we actually, this is kind of a symbolic year because we've built our last classrooms and we now have 240 children um, from April coming every day. So that's a big deal. Um, the school is based in Kilifi, which is um, 75 kilometers north of Mombasa. Um, it's a very, very poor area. Um, so we're on the Kenyan coast, but we're a little bit inland. Um, and we own um, 10 acres of land here. Um, I forgot maybe to say everything is free for the kids. Food, uniforms, school materials, everything. Um, and then everyone's like, how do you make that happen? How does that work? Because we're kind of stuck in the situation where our project is too small to be funded by the Norwegian government, and it's too big to just be supported by friends and family. Um, and if it wasn't for this guy, Martin Watson, nothing would happen. So the guy in the white t-shirt here is Martin, and he's an artist. Um, we went to school together, and for some reason, he just got on board in the beginning and started donating some of his art. Um, and that money he would send to the project. This was back in 2013, 2014. Um, and then he hooked up with Frederick, the guy with the black t-shirt, and they started what we're calling the Ekomoyo auction, which is on eBay. Um, and this year, it's also a physical event in Oslo on Saturday, so that's super exciting. So the money that's been generated through this um, annual auction is, is the only reason why we've been able to grow this fast. I mean, there's definitely been other very important sponsors, but from the beginning, this was, this was very important. Um, yeah, so I mean, basically, like I said, it's a Norwegian foundation. It's a Kenyan private um, school. Uh, we also uh, partner with Journeys of Solutions in the US. And also, there's a Dutch GoFundMe site. So our network is also starting to spread to um, the Netherlands, because we now have a head teacher from there. Mm, yeah. so. Now that I'm working on all these applications, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'm not going to pretend like we sat with this map and like, hey, let's make a project that's going to tick off all the boxes. You know, we were we started the project and all of a sudden we're looking at this thing. We're like, OK, pretty much every activity that we do is relevant here. We're not dealing with life underwater. Um, but with all the activities we have, we're kind of working pretty systematically towards the sustainability goals. So that's really cool. Um, so because I'm a little bit all over the place and it's a school and it's a farm and there's construction and there's, and, you know, there's all this stuff going on. So um, when I met Alfonso, who started Architects Without Borders in Norway, he's like, Lindsay, you need a strategic plan so that people understand what Ecomoyo is all about. Um, and I'm so happy he suggested this because this plan has really helped us in terms of finding partners, but also as a tool for us. Um, and um, the plan is basically mapping out you know, our needs in terms of construction, in terms of sustainability, um, finance, growth. Um, and there's also, um, what's that called? Um, 
suggestions on how we can deal with, you know, water shortage, waste management, um, different um, plans for agriculture. We do do quite a bit of permaculture on site. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. Jan is going to talk more about the architecture at Ipomoyo, but um, yeah, so when I bought this plot um, in the bush, because I couldn't afford anywhere near a town, I was like, okay, I need money to build stuff. So I just called all the different architect schools and tried to get people to get on board. And um, there was a team at the Oslo School of Architecture um, that wanted to collaborate. So the first two classrooms started uh, where they were built in 2017. And that really kickstarted the whole construction of the school. And it's become this unique, experimental, colorful, crazy place in the bush with all these different designs. Um, but I'm not gonna say too much because Jan is gonna talk about that. Um, and now we also, um, I mean, Engineers Without Borders, they got on board in the plan with some suggestions, but now we took that collaboration a bit further. Um, so we just had a really cool pilot project um, at the school um, in Feb, March. So we had six students from, um, and Tenu, the universe, the technological university, something, something. Because um, they're doing something called meaningful masters. So you have all these students that are doing their masters. So now in collaboration with Ecomoyo and Engineers Without Borders, they come to the school, they research, they investigate. And this year we had people on um, water and also renewable energy. And they had an amazing time. They teamed up with Mombasa Technical University. They got so many contacts in just a few weeks they were there. They set up a microgrid solar system and you know, all these ideas and information that they're gathering will also help us update our strategic plan for the project. So it's becoming this melting pot where it's like engineers, architects, you know, people, artists, and, you know, everyone's kind of coming together and just, yeah, just experimenting on site, which I love. It's not just a primary school, it's, it's a place of experimentation. So, um, you know, it's, I think it's easy to talk about all these fancy buildings and ideas and this and this, but at the end of the day, you know, this is who we're doing it for. Um, these are the faces of our students, and I already feel very convinced that just the exposure, like just them seeing all these activities happening on site, um, it's really inspiring them. You know, all of a sudden you have young girls saying they want to be an engineer, you know, back in, you know, it could have been, I want to be a hairdresser or whatever, which is fine, but, you know, they're getting ideas based on the activities that we have on site, so... Yeah, that's really exciting. I um, that's all I have. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, Lindsay. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Lindsay Senner, the founder of Ecomoya Education Norway, sharing her story, her inspiration, the steps she already took. Um, now it's time to take some questions from the audience. If you have any questions concerning this presentation, please use Slido, which uh, the code and the QR code uh, would appear on the screen. Yes, we have already a few questions. So the first one, can you imagine joining forces in Norway and Slovakia and doing a project together in Ukraine, for example? Lindsay. Um, no, I have too much going on in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would be very happy to brainstorm um, but I'm not going to lie, I'm completely overworked with trying to fund this project and catch up with all our collaborations, but I'm very, very happy to brainstorm. Um, so yes, yes, yes. Yes, very good. Yeah. Even that if uh, you wouldn't be personally involved in building something in Ukraine, 
I think uh, the inspiration, you know, sharing your experience might be a great inspiration for people, uh, for other people, for our organization to uh, go in, uh, in your steps. Definitely, uh, definitely. And I think it's also, I think what I didn't really um, emphasize too much when I was talking is that, you know, all these projects where we're trying to help someone you know, maybe that in itself is kind of old school and boring, but like, how can you implement activities that are interesting for other people to join just apart from, you know, helping the kids in Kenya, you know, whatever, like making it an interactive thing so that people can join on other levels as well, not just supporting that main cause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by listening to you, I. I um, realize that it's very important to have a strategic plan uh, because uh, yes, uh, if you want to help people, if you want to uh, do humanitarian activities, if uh, this would be just an activity for itself, uh, might just be lost in uh, in uh, in all the events and everything in the in, and wouldn't make a change. So what is the strategic plan? How important is it for you for the activities you're doing? Well, I mean, it's very important because it really helps you touch base on priorities. But then obviously, you know, all of a sudden there might be a potential sponsor that wants to support something completely mm -hmm. different. So you're not going to say no to that. But um, it really helps you map out okay, this year I'm looking for funding for this. Oh, you know, it, it's, it really helps you touch base on stuff. And it also, you know, I think when you have these humanitarian projects and you're not like Red Cross or one of these big organizations, not everyone really takes you seriously all the time. And when you can slap a plan like that on the table, everyone's like, oh, oh, it's actually kind of serious. It's like, yeah, man, that's what I'm saying. So it's kind of an alibi for showing that we're doing this for real. It's a really awesome project. It's not just me, you know, chatting about something in Africa. And, you know, it really maps out plans that are realistic and, and thought through. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if there are no other questions, I have one more question concerning how many people are employed or are volunteering with the organization? Well, we have 19 employees in Kenya at the school from the surrounding area, um, and I'm employed in the Norwegian organization. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, we have uh, five board members, and um, it's, it's really a very small setup. Um, we need more people to get involved, so if you're watching, you want to get involved, please join us and get in touch. Okay. We have another question. Uh, are your projects aimed at becoming part of official agenda of state and regional authorities? No, man. Definitely not in Kenya. I'm not going to mix up with any authorities in that country. You know, we want to kind of stay away from those guys. Maybe in Norway, um, but no, 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 no. Definitely not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe that sounds a bit weird. I just have to emphasize that Kenyan authorities, you want to be friends with them, but you don't want to mm, mm -hmm. become very good friends with them, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but I think if I uh, heard you, I, I'm very happy about uh, all the accomplishment you already achieved. You said you're a small organization, but uh, from the dream to 240 kids, uh, in school, it's a, I think it's a big leap you achieved. So we'll be happy to hear from you later. You. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my next uh, speaker is uh, Michal Sladek. He's an architect from the Association Spolka. Michal graduated from the Department of Architecture at the Academy of Fine Arts in Bratislava. He was influenced by his study residence at the CAPT University in Ahmedabad. India in the housing studio. Upon his return, he began working for the humanitarian organization People in Need on the topic of housing in socially excluded settlements. In connection with his doctoral studies at the Faculty of Architecture of Slovak Technical University, he initiated the project Architects in Settlement. Michal, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me and inviting me here. And uh, it is really, uh, uh, I'm honored to be part of the stories that we are hearing so far. And uh, I would like to share with you another story, uh, which is um, <clears throat> a story of a, of a house of uh, Voito and uh, Renata. And um, yeah, let's get into the... Uh, so uh, behind some hills and rivers, there's a little village uh, of uh, Koya called Koyatice in the district of Presho, um, which is the third largest city in, in Slovakia. And there was a little settlement, or there is a little settlement, uh, basically um, lived, um, where, where live only the Roma community, which at the time uh, was about 200 uh, people. And this is the house that um, was built and lived in by Vojto, Renata and their family, which are on this picture in front of the house that they have built. And uh, one day uh, in this settlement, uh, strange, strange guys came in holding uh, paper and uh, making phone calls. And uh, they ask Renata and Voito if they want to join a program where they could possibly build a better house. Not larger, much larger, but um, a house that they can afford and uh, they will build it um, by themselves again, which was obviously the case of their um, previous house. And so we, we invited them to um, meetings and we offered them uh, uh, all this kind of scenario that you can finance your house by, at the beginning, making a savings and then to pay off a loan that will be given for the construction materials, which is pretty much the, the scheme that uh, Veronica was uh, explaining in the housing projects that the ETP was doing. And um, the, the, the scenario for the construction will be that, yeah, in the beginning, you will be designing your own house, then you will be building it, and then you will be using it. And Voito and Renata was, were thinking a bit, and then they say, okay, we want to try. And so they met this, um, these um, uh, students of architecture that came for a workshop, and sitting together, they prepared a, um, a layout for, um, for a house for them. And uh, yeah, this, uh, as there were more people uh, trying to to get into the, the program, then there was a, a, a lottery, and Renata and Voito were lucky enough to to take the paper with number one, stating that they can build a, their house in the first batch as the, as the pilot project, and so the construction began. And um, according to the to the um, layouts, there there was a, a house being built, principally uh, or mainly by the family, but also by volunteers that they came for summer um, workshops. That they they came to the uh to the program and helping the families to in the in the construction and this um uh, this is where the idea of or the name of architects in the settlement uh came from and um there were uh, each summer two or three workshops and not only students or architects were joining but sometimes some people from a very uh different backgrounds and on this um, 
uh, picture, uh, we can see the, con the, the construction materials chosen were pretty much um, the same as, as we use on any other basic construction in the, in the environment. And uh, this is because the people, Voito and Renata, they expressed uh, the desire to, to have a house which is um, comparable to the houses in the village. And uh, there was a learning that if we want, or we are con consulting and offering uh, more sustainable materials in terms of sustainability, of, in terms of ecology, like straw and clay, uh, well, they will say, we have already a clay house and we want a normal one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, in, in thinking about the sustainability, we said, okay, the, the social sustainability is here much more important than the, probably the ecological one in terms of materials. And if we want these people to help them rise from the, or be better off and, and rise from the poverty, that's more sustainable, in fact, than if the, if the, imprint of the small house is, is bigger in the materials than, than to try to force or to, to uh, bring the materials that are unknown for the majority in the, even in the village or unknown for them, for their neighbors. Wow, this is the, the layout of the, or this is the drawings from, for the house. And this is the very basic and simple layout, which were done in the uh, during the workshop. And oh, yeah, this is again the same picture. And this is the the house, um, like before being finished, where the, the last things were 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 constructed, like the staircase, etc. And this is the house after the, the first year. Oh, uh, the colors are already there. And uh, you may notice there is a second new house behind it with a uh, red roof and I will come there. And this is the interior of the of uh, Renata's and Wojtek's household after the first year. Of, uh, uh, of the use of their new house. And then, um, unfortunately, uh, Voito has deceased. And he passed away. And Renata was left alone with the extended family in the house. And, yeah, but they were taking care of the, of the house and um, it was undergoing uh, mm, all the time, almost every year, uh, uh, new colors and some changes like you may notice the staircase is not there anymore but there's some kind of uh, uh, makeshift way how to climb up into the into the house and here i want to to uh, stop for a second lesson of of uh, learning from uh, from building in this environment is uh, probably the, the entrance for the house is not the, the most suitable to make it from the hillside because then you, you need to make some couple of stairs to climb up. And but the family expressed the desire to be oriented outside towards outside of the settlements and not to the backside of the house. And this orientation of, of windows and, and doors actually were making more sense for them for reasons that maybe as an architect we would prefer the easy access or better orientation towards the, the, the uh, uh, north and south. But for, for the family, it was more important to have this entrance from outside uh, the settlement and have windows oriented towards the the like the desirable neighbors which is uh, 
also the 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 something that probably we wouldn't uh, realize if we were not talking to the people in in preparing the the projects. This is the the settlements after uh, after the two uh, seasons of the program. There was altogether six housing units were built, and uh, I see that the the house of uh, Voito and Renata is pretty much the central position, and it was an uh, important experience. Um, in the the following um, little structures were a slightly different in design, as we realized that we can, with with much more elaborate uh, thinking over the details, we can achieve more economically, um, more economic uh, shape and and make a use of this. Um, uh, of the of the roof um, and make a little more space inside and uh, when we when we really think through and make a, a design which is uh, uh, taking in consideration the the details and also taking in consideration the the how the the building is actually built so uh, to make it easy to accomplish and to make it um, uh, technologically easy to build. And so that's why we, we came uh, with the more elaborate, elaborate details. And then uh, another um, um, NGO was, was formed, which is called Project Domo and extended uh, a new uh, way or a new um, type of the, the same idea of the same uh, of the idea of the self-help construction of individual houses and extended it to uh, more um, villages and localities in the eastern Slovakia and also they took um, all the, the project in, in uh, which uh, House of Renata and Monita was built, was merged into this uh, new organization, which is trying to um, basically fundraise and uh, bring this these projects into a certain scale. And uh, they followed in Koyatice in the same uh, settlement with another house, where you can see it here, which was built, I think, only recently. I think it was finished two years ago or maybe one year ago. Um, I was not trying to, uh, I was trying to avoid dates, so not to make you uh, uh, too confused with all the, uh, all the years where things were built. But this is how the house of... Uh, now Renata is looking like there have been some uh, extension built from this side. There is a there is a shelter for the staircase, and from the uh, back side where you don't see it, there is a shelter from uh, wood or for wood. And um, for the. Uh, uh, for the new organization, we are now making more um, um, preparational work, like uh, up, like now we are working in um, in uh, another localities to make a kind of master plan for uh, for the new housing development. Yeah, that that's the story from my side and. Uh, I'm uh, happy that I could share it with you and uh, looking for your questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Michal. We were listening to Michal Sladek, who is the architect at Spock Association, and uh, he was involved uh, with this uh, initiative, Architects uh, in the Settlement. We have some questions. Um, the first question is, are the teachers local people? This is probably a question that uh, We'll keep for Lindsay. 
but uh, I would uh, come with the other one, with the second one. Can you imagine a human approach beyond building for poor? The sustainable approach to our environment asks for human approach, the general urbanism and architecture. Um, it's a very good question, I think, for all of us on this board. Uh, for me, um, and I think I can, I can be uh, completely honest with you, um, building for, let's say, I would like to avoid poor, but yeah, for the poor people, is a kind of a shortcut how to get to uh, the client. <laughs> because um, the, the problem in, uh, in the human approach for gen like to, to make it more general is that it's not the user who is paying the architect and uh, like we can see all the real estate development in Slovakia are, are is run by uh, an economic um, uh, economic calculations and um, there it's uh, it's it's not that um, easy or obvious to have uh, to be in contact with the user of the of the real estate which is built of the of the housing project because the the uh, the one who is talking to architect is the developer and the, the one who is asking for the project and not the one who will be living there and uh, this is I think uh, um, uh, a situation where it's it's um, maybe the others can help me to to find out how as an architect we can uh, we can persuade the developer to maybe talk to the people before making the project or making a project which will be suitable for some specific um, or more special um, uh, to, to answer more specific needs, because as, at, at least in, in Slovakia, maybe we can hear the examples from Norway, uh, the flats or houses which are being built are just very gen general, genuine, and uh, so like should fit all, but then it doesn't fit specifically nobody. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We have two more questions, but I, would, I was thinking that maybe we could take these questions uh, after the next presentations, because Jan Kazimierski is also an architect, and so we could, have, we, we could listen to, to two architects uh, answering this question. So I would uh, thank now Michal for, uh, for your presentation, and we will return to this question after the next presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, welcome our next and last speaker, Jan Kazimierski, uh, who is from Norway, and he's an architect, architect without borders, and uh, he's part of Haptic Architects. After, after graduating from the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, Jan worked as a teacher at the Scarcity and Creative Studio, taking students through the whole architectural process from a drawing to a finished building. He gained theoretical and practical experience in countries such as Ecuador, uh, China, Kenya and Norway. This experience has played a significant role in how he experiences and perceives his role as an architect today. After his affiliation to HAO, he became involved with Architects Without Borders. There he today develops a new master plan for Mara Action 8, a newly established project west in Kenya, and continues his close collaboration with Ecomoyo Education Center, where he worked for the last five years as an architect and a board member. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin, for your introduction. I will start with trying to share my screen and just say a general thank you for this opportunity to sort of reflect on what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Oops, this was not the first slide. 
uh, I took this presentation as a chance to sort of uh, both reflect on what has been done and also try to maybe expand on my own uh, or on my own thoughts. So I uh, did some research on what is a humanist approach and how can we define uh, sustainable architecture and came up to or uh, arrived at these two pyramids. One is the hierarchy of needs, which um, is based on uh, uh, a psycho psychologist study by uh, the name Maslow, uh, which talks about uh, the elements um, a person needs to go through in order to sort of uh, self-actualize uh, themselves. And then uh, while doing this uh, small uh, presentation, I sort of discovered that there might be a hierarchy of building as well, and especially a hierarchy of building sustainably. And I think it uh, has been covered a bit, a bit by Michal and uh, also by Veronica earlier, and obviously Lindsay, who I collaborate with. And uh, the first pyramid speaks about uh, sort of the, uh, the five steps uh, for someone to feel uh, maybe, uh, yeah, to feel realized in life. And this doesn't apply to everyone, but I think it applies to a lot of us. And what is interesting is that the shelter, uh, so the building that we inhabit is actually one of the basic needs. And it's something that we've been trying to work with as well uh, in Ecomoyo. How can we make the, the least with... Uh, or how can we make the most out of the least materials? Uh, then you go on to uh, safety needs, which uh, speak about health and security, how you feel within uh, or uh, some um, physiological, um, physiological um, uh, what, uh, senses. And then you have the belongingness and love, which uh, ties you to a community or another person or a social group. In my case, that may be uh, Ecomoyo, it may be my family, uh, my girlfriend. And then you have the accomplishment and respect uh, level, which can only be actualized or uh, reached once you've uh, sort of um, had all the other steps accomplished. Um, and this might be something that is very personal. It might be something that uh, speaks outwards. And this pyramid is, for me, quite interesting when it uh, sort of relates to a building because a building has uh, similar, uh, similar steps, maybe, with, uh, where we speak about the material choices then how these materials or elements of the building is, uh, are arranged, and then how they relate to uh, their, their context, which should, in my mind, be local and also uh, use the local, um, the lo local method of fabrication so that it can be maintained in, uh, throughout time. And then lastly, what kind of global context maybe that building sits in? Is it something that is supposed to have uh, a further uh, sort of reach outwards to, um, to a global community or uh, can it somehow uh, become an opportunity to uh, reflect uh, on certain uh, aspects of sustainable building, for instance? And then when you have reached all these or answered all these questions, you can perhaps say that it's a building. And then you can also uh, think about the, uh, the inverse pyramid, which is when the building is start, started to be used and then actually reused or readapted to different purposes. Uh, and since it is a pyramid that <laughs> I created, <laughs> I just thought it would be fun to see uh, how this uh, relates to an actual pyramid. And uh, here you have sort of 
uh, the stone as the basic material uh, that constructs or that needs to be um, in the foundation of uh, choices. And then the spatial arrangement talks about what kind of building this is. And the stone reflects uh, this element of uh, protection and becomes also an el element that is monumental and religious for uh, the local uh, people or the people that uh, built this uh, this building. And then it has a connection to uh, materials that are sourced locally. Uh, it was built with uh, a method or uh, a way of construction that we still today uh, are unsure of um, how uh, these pyramids were executed. And then it has a global con context, which now that we uh, live with these pyramids, they actually uh, have become uh, quite significant buildings uh, culturally. They are part of sort of the ancient times and we still are able to um, look at them, which for me, it's a very uh, interesting uh, sort of uh, thing to think about that a building that has lasted for maybe 4,000 years is actually a quite sustainable building. Maybe the labor that has gone into it is not that very sustainable in the specific time and place, but uh, it is. And then when you look at this uh, structure that is built just with one material, you can so sort of start reflecting upon how the locals uh, live in uh, Kenya and in the sort of the society that me and Lindsay uh, have been part of for the last uh, couple of years. And I think there is a sort of sense of beauty in these, uh, in these uh, structures that are built of very simple materials and uh, built with uh, local uh, knowledge and also um, s something that we all uh, are able to um, find beautiful, even though it may be uh, quite primitive. So in this pyramid that we're, uh, or that I created uh, for this presentation, um, you need to understand the material uh, choices uh, so uh, what I've been doing uh, for the last couple of years is trying to understand how things are actually built and where we want to sort of focus or uh, how we want to um, make people, um, uh, how, how we want people to make these buildings. And um, these, are thing, these are aspects that we have to uh, reflect upon that concrete is being mixed by um, by manual labor. The bricks are uh, sourced manually and a very efficient method of building because the, uh, the people that are actually building this know how to uh, construct with this material. And then uh, you have the compacting on the very left side, uh, the compacting of the slab or the, the sub base of the, uh, of the floor. Uh, which is also done manually. So all of this, um, all of this um, material is being processed by uh, manual labor. And uh, when we're building, we have to take that into account that it has to be both local and it also has to be uh, done in a very simple way. So on the right side, you can see uh, my friends when we built uh, the first uh, two classrooms for Ecomoyo, lifting up a bucket of concrete and then it being poured into the lintel to create an opening. And then uh, you have in the middle uh, um, a wall that sort of uh, is uh, just made with an opening and plaster. And then on the left side, you have the, the casarina poles that are uh, sort of... Um, or the Casarina poles and the Makuti, which is a light material that is uh, easily sourced and available at all times uh, in the in the local context and can be used as um, used as uh, these um, very light and to me quite beautiful walls that everyone would know how to repair or maintain over time. 
And then you have roof materials that can um, give different conditions for what is happening on the inside. So uh, on the right side, you have the makuti, which is uh, good for places where you're supposed to sleep, perhaps, or where you're supposed to relax because it doesn't bring too much noise noise when uh, uh, when the rain hits it. In the middle, you have the mabati, which is a corrugated metal sheet, which produces noise if it's uh, just left uh, open and it rains, but it also radiates, radiates heat into the room if it's not very well ventilated. So... These are elements that we uh, try to work with. And then there's also the element of nature that there is, there is wind, there is rain, mm -hmm. and there is uh, a very um, hot sun. And then uh, these are parameters uh, that we uh, try to work around. And we also try to work uh, in sort of um, in places where we cut the least amount of trees possible. Uh, this image shows uh, a recent project that we've been developing together with 120 Hours and Architects Without Borders to uh, implement a new football field for the school. Um, and then you have the uh, ventilation of the buildings and the water collection. So we, uh, we try to make things as simple as possible with as few elements as possible so that we can uh, collect all the water uh, that is being uh, thrown at the roof into one direction. And then that roof also uh, requires uh, a ventilation strategy. So it's open on one end so that the wind can uh, go through and be, uh, and the, the heat of the sun can be uh, collected um, in between the two layers of the in between the two layers of the roof structure, so the ceiling and the, the metal uh, corrugated uh, sheet. And then you can also see that the building relates or tries to relate to uh, its surrounding by being open to one side and closed towards uh, the more common or uh, common facilities of the school. And then we talk about uh, sourcing uh, locally or how the, the building can be uh, connected to its local uh, context. So all of the materials for these two buildings, except maybe the metal corrugated sheets and also uh, the, um, the concrete has been uh, sourced uh, by the people that have actually been building the building. So uh, on the left side, you see uh, Michael uh, making uh, Makuti panels and on the right side, Moses that is uh, taking off uh, the bark of the Casarina poles. And these are people that I've been working uh, with for a long time. And the project has also had uh, many students, as Lindsay uh, uh, talked about, coming in and out of the, uh, of the building processes and co coming to see and also listen to um, how we have developed the school. And uh, the middle picture is uh, from the the, the first two classrooms that we finished in 2017, which is, uh, which looks like uh, this uh, uh, when it was finished, and that's uh, a topic for another time. How these buildings sort of develop over time, and then uh, the buildings that we finished in 2020 together with Architects Without Borders and Architectopia that uh, became quite. Uh, I think significant, at least uh, for me and also for perhaps uh, Architects Without Borders. And then there is this last slide that is uh, just showing the two, uh, the two pyramids that are, um, that where one of them is the, the pyramid that sort of speaks about the building and the pyramid that speaks about uh, self-actualization. And through this project, I feel sort of that I've also man or I've managed to build a sustainable building, but at the same time also uh, self-actualize myself, but also self-actualize people that have been involved in the project uh, themselves as well. So we've uh, given p local people the opportunity to get work, 
and the opportunity to uh, feel that they belong to the project by actually participating in the uh, in the construction process and uh, the accomplishment is, uh, in my mind, very, uh, very global, and uh, we. I still am in touch with a lot of the uh, the workers we've collaborated with, and also a lot of the um, people that have been part of this project uh, in the last couple of years. So I think that's me. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Jan Kazimierski, uh, Godzimirski for uh, his presentation and for sharing his really human approach to the architecture. Um, I would like to now come back to the questions that uh, were asked uh, after the previous presentation. And I would like to reflect uh, all the speakers, but especially architects among you, on the first one. Can different approach to architecture help build better feelings of community? What's your experience, Jan? <laughs> um, I don't know. It, I think it depends on what you define as different approach to architecture, because uh, there are many ways of approaching architecture. I think both Michal, uh, Michal and uh, me, we can uh, be people that are on the ground with people and we we actually uh, enjoy uh, being with the people that are receiving uh, our work and then there's um, architects that or yeah that build for uh, or there's projects where the community is just one person or a family or uh, yeah a place that is uh, um, that doesn't think beyond itself, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Michal, maybe. Michal, <laughs> Michal. <laughs> you have some. <laughs> What's your opinion on this? Can architecture be really a community builder? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> From your experience, but, but yes. Not, not, not only. I mean... Uh, we, uh, it's, uh, it's not the, the only aspect it can, it can be a project which is uh, in the already built environment where it can, it can help the, the make the feeling of community better without actually touching the physical spatial setup. So it's, uh, yeah, architecture can uh, can be the, the the method or can mm -hmm. be used, but not mm -hmm. only. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Can we? Maybe see? I would also yes, please uh, add to that that also the space uh, between the buildings, like uh, we can also uh, shape the public space and uh, including the community in the process, which which we also have experience with, and it's uh, a learning process, a community building process, is also uh, better fits i believe the needs of, of the local community so it's also one of the great tools to mm -hmm. to use <laughs> yes as i understood from all the, your presentation one of the major uh prerequisition of of sustainability is actually involvement of the local people without them it uh, it's not uh, sustainable uh thank you very much uh, can we uh yes look at the next question can you architect tectonic paradigm help change the society as a whole. So, what do you think? <laughs> is, is, is the architecture <laughs> equipped to, to bring major change in the society today? I think anything new is, uh, is capable of creating a change, but uh, uh, yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> I think, if, can I add something on that? Yes, please. Um, I think what I've noticed at our school is that, you know, in Kenya, um, it's kind of like, but we want a house like you have in Norway. Like now, you know, we don't want to live in a mud house. It's, you know, they want what we have. 
you know, so I was thinking about Mikhail's presentation as well as that, no, they didn't want to redo it in, in mud. And, you know, on the other spectrum, you have all these hippies who want to build all these cool things in mud. And at the end of the day, it's really impractical or, it, you know, it's so slow or whatever. So these are discussions that Jan and I have had quite a bit as well is like, what is sustainability? It's like, is it better with stone? Is it better with mud? But what I've noticed is that people who come to visit the site who can see that, you know, I mean, I'm talking about Kenyans um, from different uh, parts of society. They see that, yeah, you can actually use mud in a really cool way that makes it look modern. Or, yeah, you can use, you know, makuti, which is palm leaves, and it can seem classy and, you know, you don't, you know, I think that people connect mud to poverty and when you show that material in a different context you can kind of broaden their horizon and and help build up a pride of local materials that has maybe vanished a bit with wanting everything to be plastic fantastic because that's their association with modern future western stuff right so so I, you know, I, I think that's definitely, like, I'm just thinking about in our Kenyan context, it's like, um, I think people are inspired by that, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. It was a good point. Uh, can we ha have the last question? If there are, I don't know if there are any more questions. Oh, there are two more, uh, one more question. Okay. Do you think it is possible to scale up your architectonic approaches? No, this is a good question. I don't know. I think that's something <laughs> we're still working on. At least I am. I know that uh, I eventually want this to be implemented at the larger scale, mm -hmm. or at least try try out some of the principles at the larger scale. If it's larger in terms of area that it takes, or taller, I don't know. But. Uh, uh, I think what we're doing all the time is just trying to uh, learn more and be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I think this the question about sustainability is a very often, at least in architecture, it's a very uh, technical question. It's not that it's it doesn't speak so much about um, the local community and. Uh, I think if one tries to uh, build this uh, pyramid and check off all the boxes of sort of materials, um, the spatial arrangement to satisfy maybe the architectural community and uh, the technical aspect of, uh, of uh, what the roof and the wall and the floor is supposed to do, and then you actually start talking about the local community and also the global impact of what you're doing. I think uh, mm -hmm. it is scalable. Okay. It's okay. just something that needs to be not only implemented by architects, but also by developers. Okay. Um, Michal, would you like to comment on this? Or Veronica, maybe, from your experience? You mean on the new question or? Yeah, on, on the question if it's scalable. If what you're doing in, a, in, a, in these settlements you, you were showing us in this ghetto in Lunig 9, if it would be scalable to, uh, to all the settlements, let's say in Slovakia, and what are the conditions for that? What's, I, I think what are the obstacles? The an answers already were shown on uh, 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 what, what Michal was showing and what I was showing as well, like regarding the micro credits and the saving program that it has already been done several times in several localities. But then again, uh, I would stress that um, each community is different. So we need to be aware of the local uh, context. And also if the conditions are met for, for this project to start off. So there has to be some land available for, for new building and, and uh, there has to be a good cooperation with the municipality. And so, so mm -hmm. the, there are some right conditions that have to be um, met. And then, then yeah, we can, we can um, mm -hmm. um, adjust 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. I can also mm-hmm. yes, please. I can also add that what has been really uh, interesting with the Komoyo is that we have in in some sense been the developers, so we can we can really uh, be in charge of uh, everything from the beginning to the end, and we have a very close contact with the community and. Uh, and with the people involved and they understand our ambition or our goal as well as we understand what their uh, their need uh, and ability is so it's a it's a very uh, long process in order I think to reach uh, uh, reach the scalability aspect of such a process thank you very much uh, we have here a last question which is in Slovak, I will, I, will, I will translate it into English. And it says, uh, it's probably referring to Kenyan uh, experience. Uh, so what is the, what is the cost of uh, the building compared to the wages of uh, the construction workers? So the, at least the, the buildings that we've been building, we try to uh, keep them around 50 US dollars per square meter Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I can't uh, say that's the last calculations that I've uh, that I've done Mm -hmm. so uh, or at least that's the calculation that we did for this uh, um, the thatched roof building Mm -hmm. okay okay thank you very much okay ladies and gentlemen uh, this is uh, the end of our workshop today um, it's, it's, it was the, the second workshop uh, we are organizing in the framework of uh, the Slovak Norwegian uh, cultural matchmaking uh, project initiative. Uh, we will meet uh, in, on the 7th of April uh, for the third one, where we would like to discuss uh, uh, the topic of interdisciplinary online lab on inclusive culture. So we would like to invite you already for uh, for the next uh, meeting or, or the online online workshop on the seventh of uh, of um, of uh, April. Before we go, we would like to ask you uh, to give us your feedback, very simple feedback about your satisfaction of today's workshop. Please leave us your stars as as uh, when you are the good booking hotel, but <laughs> we, we just try to keep it very simple. Okay, I would like to uh, thank v- very m- much our speakers today. It was a pleasure uh, having them uh, uh, in our, uh, on our workshop. It was a really interesting uh, to listen to how architecture, how building, how housing can change uh, human lives. In a, in a deprived uh, community throughout the world in Slovakia. Uh, it was my pleasure to have uh, uh, this uh, wonderful speaker here. My name is uh, Martin Mojiz and I work uh, for the Creative Industry Košice and I was happy to moderate uh, this, uh, this event for you. Thank you very much for your attention.